Hi, everyone. So my name is Mackenzie, and I work for the American Forest Foundation. Um, but this webinar series is, is put on by one of our programs, um, the American Tree Farm System. So that is the largest and oldest sustainable woodland system in America. We work to give our tree farmers the tools they need to be effective stewards of America's natural heritage. So this is normally um, just a landowner webinar series that we advertise to our tree farmers, but for this non-timber forest products series, we've teamed up with some great folks um, at the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, the USDA National Agroforestry Center, the USDA Forest Service, and the Extension Forest Farming Community of Practice. And I think all of our speakers came from that community of practice, um, and it's been great so far. Um, a couple questions that you might have. Um, if you are looking for CFE credits, this uh, webinar has been approved, and I send the list of names a month after today. So we give, so you have a chance to, um, like if you miss part of the webinar or if you want to watch it later, um, we keep track of the names for up to a month, and then I move it to a different service that doesn't keep track of names. So um, you should expect to get that credit in a month. Um, you will be getting the slides and a recording, regardless of whether you're attending today or not. Um, everyone who registered will get the slides and the recording. So another thing is just so you can get a view of some other upcoming webinars in this series. Um, next week we're doing Forest Brews, which is just what it sounds like, um, brewing beer and other beverages from forest products. Uh, and then we've got pine straw, forest cultivated mushrooms, and forest botanicals. And then there's actually another one that I need to put on there, um, art products from the forest, so like dyes and um, things to make baskets with and those sorts of things. But today, we're all about the food. And so we have Jim Chamberlain from the USDA Forest Service. And he's here to tell us about ramps. Um, I think that's all that I need to say. So take it away. Great. Aloha, everybody. It's nice to see all those smiling faces out there. Actually, I can't see anybody. But it's kind of, so it's kind of weird to sit here and talk uh, to my screen. But uh, I am Jim Chamberlain. I do uh, research for the Forest Service. I'm with the Southern Research Station. I'm based in Blacksburg, Virginia. And my specialty or area of interest are non-timber forest products. And how do you do a couple things? One, manage these as natural resources. But then two, and what I want to talk to you today about, is how do you forest farm uh, these plants for maybe a little extra income? Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been focusing my attention on uh, ramps, which are an onion, and I will talk to you in great detail about that over the next few minutes. Uh, but uh, So I've been focusing on edible plants and medicinal plants, and particularly today we're going to be talking about this, this onion. Bear with me while I get my bearings. So in this slide you see, so I've spent several years out uh, with harvesters. I wanted to learn from the harvesters how much they harvest and how they process ramps and how they um, harvest them and what are the eco ecology of ramps and sort of the impact of, of ramps. In the upper right hand corner you see uh, some gentlemen that are cleaning ramps. This is a fire department that on that particular day they had collected about 700 pounds of ramps, and then they worked uh, well into the night cleaning and preparing them for their annual festival. Uh, and of course, we know a great deal about ramps from the annual festivals that uh, civic groups put on, and they're probably most famous for uh, these festivals. But the photographs in the bottom are actually from a farmer's market in Manhattan. On the lower side of Manhattan is the oldest uh, farmer's market in the United States. And I was able to go there one day and uh, explore to see if people were actually uh, selling ramps. And you can see 
that yes, they were. And so these ramps were probably harvested from uh, the wild in New York State. But let's take a little history walk because uh, I think it's really important to, to understand history when we're talking about ramps and how they fit uh, into our culture and our society. So back in the 1700s, there was a great migration of people from Scotland and Ireland into this country. And over about 40 years, almost 300,000 people from those countries emigrated uh, to the United States. And these folks had a long history of collecting a plant uh, from the forests around their homelands. And Allium ursinum, called Rampsum, is an onion. And ursum, it means bear. And it has been said that they call this bear garlic because uh, it was the first plant that was uh, eaten by bears after the long uh, hibernation in the winter time. The map on the right shows the distribution of ramps in England, and you can see that uh, the dark, bright red indicates uh, where the ramps. Oh, I can do my arrow here, so you can see all this air, this dark red area is where they're finding ramps in those in that country. So. To give you an idea, the dark green area uh, throughout Europe and all the way over into Asia is suitable habitat for ramps or for this particular allium. So it suggests that the folks that were living in this area uh, could have been uh, harvesting the ramps uh, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And so when they came to this country, they brought with them this knowledge about a plant. And actually, just a little side note, this area right in here in Central Asia, uh, I was over there about two months ago, and they have a very similar plant uh, called an allium or a, an onion that is wild harvested from their forests, and they... Uh, put them in the market and re eat, regularly eat them. Let's see if I do this. So the folks that uh, migrated here, they brought with them everything they needed. They didn't have any stores to buy stuff, so they brought with them their food, their medicine, their tools, and sundry items. And when they ran out of those items, they had to forage and find uh, food or other things that they could use. Now these early settlers, they came in from Scotland and Ireland. They came up the Delaware River. One moment. So they came up this Delaware River to what's now Philadelphia, into this area. They then jumped on wagon trains and came down the Shenandoah Valley to what is now Roanoke, Virginia, at which point they sold their wagons, got on to horseback, and came down further into the North Carolina and Tennessee area. Some of them went west into Kentucky and West Virginia. So if you look, look at the demographics of this region, you see a lot of people with Scotch and Irish background. So when they were walking through the forest, they looked down in a spring day, and they saw a plant that was similar to what they had been digging at home. And they looked at it closely, and they may have actually smelled it before they actually saw it and said to themselves, there's a similar smell. So then they looked down at this plant, and they may have harvested the plant and said, hey, this is very similar to what we have at home, and they started calling them ramps. There are probably 700 species of ramps uh, throughout the world, we're familiar with a few of them, such as garlic, scallions, chives, bulb onions. All of these are related uh, species. Only a few of them are actually wild harvested. Now, in the United States, we have two varieties of ramps. On the upper left-hand corner, 
we see a, one that has very broad leaves and a pink kind of petiole. Uh, and they believe this is called Allium trichocum. And you can see the distribution map in the lower left-hand corner of where we find ramps. So down in this, throughout this whole area that I'm mostly familiar with. Now, in the upper right-hand corner is a map of Allium trichocum variety Burdickii. And you can see that its distribution map has it coming down into the area where I live. Uh, but I have measured, harvested, and measured over 10,000 plants. And I have yet to see any evidence that this particular plant uh, exists down in the same habitat with Trichocum. This is what I believe we might call Burdickii. And I found this. Uh, growing in central New York uh, behind my parents' place some years ago. And you can see that it has much thinner leaves, narrower leaves. It's not as, doesn't clump as much as we see over here in Trichocum. Uh, and it has no real distinct petiole, so there's no real distinct stem on the plant. You can see a really distinct stem here and over oh, right here, but this particular plant doesn't seem to have any. So if you're in a northern climate, say up in the, this area, you might be seeing this particular plant, whereas more commonly speaking, you're going to see this particular plant. Uh, other than the, these few morphological differences, you don't really uh, see much difference between the plant itself. An interesting side note that you might be interested in the city of Chicago up in here, the, uh, the name Chicago is Native American for the ramp itself. So back in the 1700s or even earlier than that, some French uh, explorers were traveling up to this place, and they got to this, this particular place that the, and talked to the Native Americans. The Native Americans told them that this place was named after a plant that has, is very odiferous and very smelly, and they came to realize that it, Chicago meant ramps. Just a little side note for your interest. So let's talk about how the plant develops over time. And that's really important when we want to uh, think about managing for ramps, if you have a, a stand of ramps and you want to manage for them, or if you want to actually forest farm the ramps. Um, ramps are spring ephemerals. And what do I mean by that? That means that they're one of the first plants to come up in the springtime, and then they die back. Uh, early in late spring or early early summer. So they do not persist throughout the whole summer like many of the other um, forest plants do. So they're an ephemeral. They pop up, they photosynthesize, they produce all their, all their uh, carbohydrates that they need to live for the rest of the year, and then the leaves die back. If you look at this photo, you see in the left side, these bulbs are pretty small, whereas the ones on the right are fairly large, bulbous kind of things. The bulb is the storage facility or storage organ. Let's do this. We'll go to the next slide. I'll give you an idea of what the bulb, what the plant looks like. So now I measured over 8,500 plants, and this is all in metric. So the bulb. The average bulb diameter from here to here is almost 12 millimeters when they are at their maximum. The petiole, this area here, is about 4.5 millimeters across. The average leaf width was about 40. And the length, this whole length, was about 174 uh, millimeters. And then the leaf area, come to find out, was about 106 
uh, square millimeters. Now, why do I talk about that? Well, the old-timers told me when I first started working on that that they could predict the size of this bulb based on the dimension of the leaf. And sure enough, you can, fig you can fairly well predict the size of the bulb on the leaf. So as the leaf gets bigger, the bulb gets bigger. That makes a lot of sense. On average, the plant has two leaves. Sometimes it has three, as you can see in this plant. I've seen one plant out of 8,500 that actually had four leaves. It has a pink petiole that merges into a bulb, which I said earlier is the storage organ for the plant. And then attached to the bulb, this little thing right down there and right here, is a rhizome. And then attached to the rhizome are these little hairy roots. So what happens with this plant is that when the leaves come up, it photosynthesizes and stores the carbohydrates in the bulbs. And then when the leaves fall, die back, then the plant depends on the bulb to uh, sustain itself through the rest of the year. So let's talk about the life history of this plant. Uh, and it's, this is really important as well because it's important to know when the bulbs come up and when they are at their, the best time to harvest them. So if we start at the beginning of the year, you may go in the woods and they'll be covered up with snow. And the bulbs, the plant is underneath the ground. And then around in the middle of March, the bulbs start, the plant starts emerging. The leaves uh, are just barely visible uh, out of the forest floor. You can see a little bit of the purple or pink stem coming up. The plant emerge at this area. And then by the third week in April, the leaves are fully developed. The plant is photosynthesizing like crazy. It's producing carbohydrates. So the bulb is, is getting bigger and bigger. All right, back now, back in the middle, first week in May or so, early in May, this flower stalk starts appearing. And that's called a scape, right? Then by the middle of May, when the tree canopy closes, the leaves will die back. And all you'll be able to see is the, is the scape or the developing flower. So the flower starts blooming in June or so. Now these dates are flexible depending on your particular location. If you're in a northern climate, they may be slowed down a little bit. If you're at a higher elevation, they may slow down. If it's a particularly cold or wet year, they may vary a little bit. But in general, the flowers bloom in early June, and then they're fully developed by the end of August. And you'll see pods, these little round things, so the seeds are developing. And then just about now, until the middle of October or so, the seeds then are these little black, hard, BB-sized seeds uh, fall off their distributed by gravity. Uh, they fall off and then are covered up by the leaves, tree leaves, when the tree, tree leaves senesce and they act as a mulch. So then those seeds that have dropped in on the ground around November, October, they will sit dormant underneath the soil, underneath the leaves until March at which time they're going to germinate and start their process again. Now, if they don't germinate in March, they're going to sit dormant underneath the ground for another whole year until they get to that point, right? And then they'll germinate. If they don't germinate that second year, then probably they're not going to germinate or germination is going to decrease significantly. I see I have a question. How easily do the seeds travel over snow? 
Probably not very much. They don't, I don't believe that the seeds move very far from the mother plant. So if you go into, and I'll see if I have a photo of uh, a plant, and you'll go, if you see a, a plant itself, you'll have either an individual plant or a clump of plants. And that's probably that because the seed just drops, they're very heavy, and they just drop on the ground by that. Let's go to the next slide. So it's really continuing on the discussion of how the plant develops. And we'll, you'll understand when I get through this part of the story, you'll really understand why it's important to know this. So in the beginning of March, the third week in March, the average diameter of the bulb is somewhere between 6 and 8 millimeters. I like to think it's about the size of your, the, your pinky finger. And then it slowly develops till about the first week in April, and then it just takes off like crazy. And it increases significantly, sometimes 30% in a week or so. And at the end of the season, which is around the third week in May, the bulbs are around 16 to 18 millimeters in diameter. So they go from 6 millimeters to about 8 millimeters in about 8 to 10 weeks. And then if we were to graph this for the rest of the year, you would see that that bulb diameter drops down to the point where it's back to 6 or 7 millimeters, right? Now if we look at the leaf area as well, and I think it's important, let me mention at this point, that all the material is edible. So if so we want to know how much bulb material is in there, but we also want to know how much leaf material is there so that we can maximize the edible biomass that we harvest. So at the same time that the bulb is developing, the leaves are developing as well. And these first two weeks, almost three weeks, the leaf area is negligible. So it's really not even measurable uh, for those first three weeks. But then you can see that it's a tremendous increase in leaf area uh, by the second week in April. And then it really maxes out around that first week in May. And then because, and you'll see in the next couple slides, the reason for this is that the tree canopy oh, under which these plants are growing is getting developed to the point where the leaves of the ramps are falling off and dying. So then by the middle of May, you see very little leaf area to be measured. Right? So then you look at, at the same time that these plants are developing, the tree canopy overhead is developing. So in the early March, the tree canopy looks like this. Lots of sticks with no leaf area or no leafy material. And then by the middle of May, that same canopy is just full, completely full. And interestingly enough, people say that ramps need lots of sun or lots, excuse me, lots of shade to grow. But in fact, they like lots of sun. They don't like a lot of shade early in the season. They like shade later in the season, right? So what this does, it keeps moisture, it helps retain moisture in the soil so that the ramps don't dry out and desiccate over the season. So they like a lot of sun early. They like a habitat that has lots of sun early, and then that merges into lots of shade later in life. So let's look at the next slide. So at the same time, this is a graph of how the canopy develops over time. You can see here, second, first week in April, that the canopy, this is 70 to 80% transparency. That's just the inverse 
of the amount of shade that it gets. So that means it's about 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent shade. And then over time, it drops down to about 10 percent transparency or 90 percent shade. This is the kind of habitat that ramps really like. So let me see. I've got a couple questions here. Will the ramps grow in coniferous forests such as the Rocky Mountains? They really don't like coniferous forests because the soils are significantly different. Uh, the soils in coniferous forests are higher pH and, and the like. There is an allium that does grow in the Pacific Northwest that folks do go out and harvest uh, those plants. And hold on a second, I've got another question. Would it be safe to say it must have frozen ground? We are south of Mississippi, 50 miles above the Gulf Coast, and we have had hardwood forests and bottomlands and creek beds that would be probability of growing them down here. Um, that's a good question. You don't really see their natural habitat uh, is not really as far south as as Mississippi. Uh, it's probably because it's too hot, and it's a different forest type. So ramps like beech, birch, maple, uh, those kind of hardwoods, they don't really like uh, really dry oak forests that you might find down in that area. Um, there's another question, are the names varieties or locations? Excuse me, my I can't see that bunch of the screen, so I'm having trouble reading all of the questions. So if I, uh, the names are varieties. Those are definitely varieties, so that's a variety burdickii. Uh, and then we have another question, are the, are the prominent in deciduous forests, or what about mostly deciduous forests? Like I said earlier, they really like uh, the Appalachian hardwoods, the northern hardwood forests that you see, uh, Cumberland hardwood forests, uh, beech, birch, maple, cherry, tulip poplar, a uh, little bit of oak, but not much. Uh, ramps are, per are perennials, uh, and they will, sit, they will live for a long time. Um, I think a lot of people go out and they harvest the clumps of ramps, and I will argue that that is an old growth plant. Uh, you think about if we could go back, can I go back to this slide? Let me back up to this slide. There. So the plant germinates in March, and if it doesn't germinate in March, it goes back for another 17 months and germinates again. So then it grows for its growing season is pretty much from March until May. So it has to put on a lot of biomass. Um, and then what happens is it does this for five or six years before it gets to that size where it's really meaningful. And at some point in time, we're going to go back to this so at some point in time, you see these rhizomes. They have uh, buds on those rhizomes, and they will produce another bud or another bulb off that rhizome. So it splits, and then you have two bulbs. And then that might, then that might persist for a couple more years, and then you have another bulb off that rhizome. So then you're up to three bulbs, and then four bulbs, and that process by which you get to like clumps of ramps could take 20 or 30 years. So, you know, uh, they, you could have a plant that's 20 or 30 years old. Uh, the scapes are edible. All, all parts of the plant are actually edible. I know P, uh, a guy that I worked with in Indiana, uh, or maybe with Illinois, uh, he was selling the scapes to restaurants. He was selling the flowers to restaurants. He was selling a variety of things to the restaurants. So let me move back up and find where were we. Oh, yes. So then, so we're looking at bulb development, leaf development, relative to canopy uh, development, 
And what we do then is look at the optimal time to harvest these plants is around the first week, the end of April, early May. So this is the point where the, there is the act maximum amount of edible biomass is about right before the leaves start really dying back and getting yellow. And this would be the optimal time to be harvesting the plant back up in here. So about two weeks before full canopy or when the canopy is about 50% development. And that's really what, if you harvest back up in here, it's much too, the plants are too small. And, uh, you know, it's, you're going to reduce the amount of biomass, the maximum biomass, right? So let me go to the next slide. And this is what you're looking for. It's that kind of bulb that you're looking for. This is probably the largest bulb that I have ever seen lengthwise. So you figure that's probably three inches there, and this is probably a good inch. Um, there is, the question is, um, two questions. I live in Montana, so this type of allium would be and I'm in the northwest Montana. I would have to look that up, Maggie, to determine what kind of allium you have growing up in there. But I know there are uh, wild alliums growing in that area. Uh, but we could, I could help you figure out which one that is. And then the next question from Tony, is there a way to sustainably harvest from these clumps? And yes, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Give me a moment to catch up with that. Uh, so you're looking for this particular maximum biomass uh, that you want. And so to get a bulb like that could take, you know, five or six, seven, ten years uh, to, to get something like that. So now we turn to forest farming. And just, I don't know how familiar folks are with forest farming, but it's not a new thing. Back in the 1920s, this guy, J.R. Smith, sort of started promoting the idea of, of forest farming. And he said hey, certain crops could be grown underneath trees um, that would help conserve the environment as well as providing substitute foods, right? Uh, and then more recently, the University of Missouri suggests that forest farming is the cultivation of understory high-valued specialty crops underneath trees. Within an established forest, it's either intensive and deliberate, and it introduces much more uh, diversity into the forest system. Well, I take it a step further. I suggest that forest farming is the cultivation or management of understory plants uh, underneath native trees, regular trees. Um, but it doesn't have to be high-valued specialty crops. As a matter of fact, many of the non-timber forest products are not specialty crops, but are in fact commodities uh, that are traded in very large quantities at very low prices. They also could be forest farming, could be an established or a planted forest. So if you have planted forest uh, in your uh, fields, and you might want to start growing products underneath there. Um, it's not necessarily intensive. And some of the most successful forest farming uh, practices are not intensive at all, but are much are low uh, inputs, very simulating uh, wild conditions. So the bottom line with forest farming is how do you take an area like that? Oh, good question, Tracy. Yes, any, Tracy asks, are there any plants that could be mistaken for ramps? Absolutely. <laughs> and I had an interesting story. I was down in North Carolina, and I met this guy who was living out of his vehicle, uh, and he asked me what I was doing, and I told him that I was collecting these ramps, and I showed it to him. 
And uh, a week later, I came back, and I he said, "Oh, I had the most terrible experience with ramps, and uh, I ate them, and I got sick as a dog, and I had I was throwing up, and I was in the fetal position for several days. There are poisonous plants out there uh, that look like ramps. That you, so you need to be very careful." in when you go out and collect them. If it doesn't smell like an onion, don't eat it. That's the simple bottom line. If it doesn't have that really distinctive garlicky onion smell, stay away from it. Okay, so back to this. So the big question is, how do you take a patch, if this is a patch of ramps, if you have a piece of property like this, and some of the ramps growing in there, or it's habitat that could be used for ramps, what do you do with that? And there are basically two approaches. You could either manage this, or you can start forest farming this particular. And we're going to talk first about managing it. And let me just catch up with myself, because i got to figure out what I'm saying. Okay. So anyway... Ramps, you can see in this picture here that most of these ramps are individual plants. You see lots of individuals, but you also see clumps of ramps, right? So they grow in as individuals at first for the first few years, and then they start producing these clumps. And what you want to do is really look for, um, be aware of how you're managing for these. The clumps represent old growth plants and they could include you know a dozen bulbs or more. So what you do let's see here. Let's go. Here we go. So a couple things that you want to think about. Uh, if you're going to harvest clumps, pull the whole clump out, take a third of them and then return the individuals to the ground where it was. You could actually take those individuals and move them around, and that will help fill in gaps. So let's say we harvested this clump here, and there were 12 plants all growing together. I would take a third of those, and then I would take the individuals and put them back in here, and maybe some over here. Now recall that there's a rhizome attached to that bulb. And for the, rhiz for the plant to survive, it needs both some of the rhizome and the bulb to grow. So you want, it, you want to make sure that that rhizome stays attached to the plant that you're growing back. Some people say to take only 10% of a per patch in a particular year. There was research being done down in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park years ago. And they looked at the impact that harvesting has uh, on the plants. And their bottom line recommendation was not to, to take less than 10% of a patch like this. And then to rotate to another patch the following year to give this patch time to rest. And the rotate down around and actually, their recommendation was to rotate into 10 different patches. That may not be possible for you, but if you are harvesting for personal use, you might cut this patch up into quarters, and I'll harvest from this quarter and harvest from this quarter and move things around. Also, look for flower stalks. Recall that the flower stalk, stalks start coming out uh, towards the end of April, they're very prominent at that time. Don't harvest that plant. If you harvest that plant and you remove the uh, flower stalk from that plant, you are removing the ability of that plant to produce seed. So if you can, re if you can avoid harvesting these flowers, then you can help ensure that the plants will regenerate, right? So you can see up through this whole hillside, there are flowering plants 
all the way up through this hillside. So you really want to avoid harvesting that flower until you want it to really let the seed uh, develop and uh, mature over time. Right? Any other questions? So this is an I, kind of an ideal kind of place for ramps, right? You have hardwood forest, mixed hardwood, so you have some big trees and some small trees. You have a little swale of moisture coming down here. You've got some associated plants, similar plants that you find growing in the same habitat. So let's say you want to now grow, you want to plant this area. So you want to look for places that have high shade, shade when the tree canopy is closed. And recall, you want it to be about 10% shade in March and then progressing to about 85, 90% shade by in the middle of May. So you look for a mixed mature mixed hardwood stand, uh, slope land that drains. Uh, typically these are north and northeast facing slopes. And those are chosen because typically they are moister and cooler than uh, the other uh, aspects. And you look for companion plants. Look for plants that grow similarly to, plant, to ramps. For example, Ah, Sean, you have a question, and his question is, what is the northern limit for these to grow? They grow all the way up into Canada, Montreal, Quebec, uh, that far up. Uh, I'm not sure if they're up into the Acadian forest. Maybe Dave Fuller could address that at a later time. Uh, so you're looking for companion plants. For example, if you find bloodroot, this is sanguinaria, canandensis. Uh, you find these particular plants, that's a good indication that ramps will grow in this area. Or other associated plants with this. For example, you have, you have bloodroot, you have blue cohosh, you have black cohosh, Dutchman's pipe, sweet sicily, maidenhair fern. It's these kind of associated plants that you really want to look for in deciding to manage or plant the understory with ramps. Um, so let's now move to, if you want to, if you don't have the, the best sites, you might think about planting them in raised beds. The question is, it more, is it more effective to spread ramps to new suitable sites by separating clumps and moving individual plants, or to harvest seed and plant the seed in the new location? I have done both. Uh, I think both have their pluses and minuses. Um, bulbs will uh, speed that transition along uh, faster because you're moving the plants along. Uh, seed takes longer to germinate and to, to regrow. Uh, seed is probably cheaper than bulbs, and uh, it doesn't, if you're going to, if you have a patch of ramps and you pull up a clump, it's going to impact those plants somehow. So if you can do, if you have your own woodlot and you have the time, uh, certainly seed is a good way to, to go about spreading these plants around. Uh, so I've, did, I've been trying to grow these in raised beds uh, in the woods. Um, I find that sometimes you don't have the best sites. Maybe your site is dry. Maybe it's too, not really the right uh, tree story. I know our friends down in Mississippi asked the question, can you grow them? Well, you might be able to grow them in raised beds underneath the tree canopy. So you, you see this picture here, you know, the soils are really dry. There's not a lot of moisture. There's not a lot of vegetation up in this area. So we're now growing them in raised beds. 
Uh, and basically, you can see how they're grown. Again, you would for the site conditions, you're going to look for the same sort of overstory, same sort of shade. Critical is moisture. This is the critical part. So if you have that moisture, uh, this is the important thing. So let's start with planting stock first. Um, actually, let me back up and talk about building these raised beds. Um, Sean asked the question, would thinning a clump, clump actually help it? It may. It may spur growth. Uh, it may improve and might reduce competition because they get pretty clumped up and they get, they're competing for that space, uh, so that might help them. Uh, and it actually might spur growth, so it stresses them out a little bit and increases growth. Are they susceptible to deer predation? I have seen very little herbivory on the plant itself. Occasionally I see a little bit of nibbles that could be deer or turkey browse, uh, but I think for the most part humans are the only thing that eat these plants. You know, how many people, how many animals like eating onions? Right. Uh, any experience with ramps in a huge coulter bed, mounded beds built around a timber core? I'm not familiar with that, Tony, but I think you can actually do that. Uh, so we're we're building. We just basically took landscape ties, cut one in half. These are eight feet long and four feet wide. We nailed them together. We put some weed cloth to keep the weeds down, and then we filled it with planting um, soil, topsoil, that we just bought at the local, you know, hardware store. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing if they will grow and how they do. Uh, we've got test sites in New York and Virginia. And, frankly, I have ramps growing in flower pots in my backyard. I've got ramps growing in my uh my vegetable garden. Uh, the trick is moisture. As long as you have enough moisture, you'll be doing all right with growing ramps. So you get you start with this growing stock, right? And these are the little tiny things just after immersion. These there's one, two, three, four, five bulbs. They're all attached to a rhizome at the bottom here. And then we then separate them so they're individual plants. And you can see how tiny they are. That plant right there is probably smaller than your pinky. And you can see right here, there's a little bit of rhizome there with the bulb attached and the greens are come, starting to come out. Uh, I don't know if bears will eat them or not. That's a really good question. They were called bear garlic in Scotland and Ireland, so I wouldn't be surprised if bears uh, didn't eat them. So now this is our planting stock. We received, we planted, we bought, I don't know, 20 pounds of ramps, ramp starters, and they came to us like this. We stored them in a refrigerator for a couple weeks, you can do that as long as you keep them, sort of keep the roots moist and keep them cool. You can see how they're yellowing because they haven't, they, they're really wanting to photosynthesize. So then what we did is we took these apart and we healed them into a little soil and got them going before we actually started planting them out. We then planted them, and we planted them about, the, each row was about four to six inches apart, and then within the row, we planted the ramps about three inches apart. And we made a furrow across the raised bed that was about, oh, I would say it was probably two inches deep, and then we just laid these plants, the starters, into that furrow and then just push the soil back up against it, right? 
So you want you don't want them too deep, and you want basically the bulb just below the soil surface. So where the petiole starts to taper out and to form a bulb is about the depth that you want to be planting these plants. There's really no reason to use fertilizer or anything like that except to ensure that they are kept moist. So this is the final product and we have plants in there. So we did, row, we did rows across the bulb plants like this and then planted within that. The important thing to remember, and I get this question a lot, is they say, well, Jim, I planted ramps like you told me, but now it's June and July and I don't see anything. They're all dead. Well, in fact, in June and July, all these leaves that you see here will uh, will die back and you won't be able to see them. Right? So don't worry if it's June or July or August or off the off season and you don't see leaves, don't worry the plants are probably just dormant. Uh, we have another question here and it says, Deer do eat the wild ramps every year unless I get them first. Okay, I've not seen that, but I'm sure deer will pretty much eat anything, I think. And then, Tony, what time of the year do you plant? That's a good question, Tony. If you're planting seed, then I would recommend you plant um, right before the year gets really cold. So the end of October, early November would be good. Uh, before all the leafy material, tree leaves have fallen off is a good idea. If you're planting bulbs, then you want to plant, um, say, early March, mid-March. Um, there is a source of seed. I don't source the material. I didn't put it on one of my slides. Uh, but if you have a pen and paper, the gentleman's name is Glenn Facemeyer, F-A-C-E-M-I-R-E. -E, and you can search him on Google. And he produces seed, he sells seed, and he sells bulbs. Uh, and Janine Davis with NC State is another good source for more information. Uh, Elizabeth, I assume I, I answered your question about when is a good time to plant. So bottom line, let's see if we can move this forward. So bottom line, you have two different approaches to growing ramps. You can start to mimic nature and grow them as wild simulated, just putting them back in the ground like this and kind of managing the whole habitat for ramps. Or you can do it more of a forest farming uh, activity. You don't have to do raised beds. I use raised beds because they, it helps control the moisture, it helps control the weeds and a variety of things, you could put them right directly underneath your trees. Uh, so now let's turn our attention just to briefly uh, look at some of the other plants that you might grow. Uh, but first, before we leave ramps, you know, here is, this is at a Whole Foods market in Manhattan three years ago and they were selling ramps at $10 a pound. This is not a ramp, but these are over here. And frankly, these bulbs look a little small to me. I would have waited a couple more weeks before I harvested. Though you can see the leaves are full, that means the plant was photosynthesizing like crazy and just hadn't had enough time to put a lot of bulb material on. In another place, also in Manhattan, was they were selling at $3 a bunch. And that bunch was probably a quarter of a pound or so. And you can see these, the bulbs are much more developed than the ones in the previous pictures. Now the old timers tell me that the small bulbs are sweeter and less pungent than these big bulbs. And I'm not sure about that. And I think one of the mystiques and one of the, the attractive things about this plant is the pungency of, of the plant. I've got a couple questions I'd like to address. 
do the seeds need to be stratified? They do require a cold, warm stratification uh, that you would find in nature. You can do that um, within, with, in a refrigerator as well. Uh, there's another question. We have something, I can't read that, growing wild. Would this be considered a common companion plant? I'm not sure, Sean. I'd have to look that up. And another quick question about moisture. You say make sure it's moist enough, but well, what level of moisture are you talking? Do you maintain moisture in beds? I don't do any... Um, watering or irrigation of these beds that I have growing. Uh, you just don't want them to, I mean, if it's if it looks like it's really drying up, you have, want to put some moisture into the soil. I have seen ramps growing in rivulets, in, in streams. I've seen them growing in very, very damp soils, but I don't think they really want to sit in water all the time. So I think you have to kind of play that one by ear. Let's turn our, here's some possibilities that you might be able to forest farm. And I do, these are just plants that I saw uh, at farmer's markets. And, you know, they're, I think the, the important thing to realize about some of these is that they may be weeds and they may, may be noxious uh, invasives that you want to reconsider. But, for example, stinging nettle is certainly a possibility. We have another question. Ostrich fern growing along the riparian zone, would this be a companion plant? I would say so. I don't know a lot about ostrich fern, um, but I would think if I saw some place with ferns growing, yes, I would consider that. Uh, you have to be careful with ferns because they may just take over and, and completely outcompete the ramps, um, if that makes sense. So stinging nettle, is he there? Yep, so there, here's a possibility. You can germinate, germinates in 10 to 14 days. It likes the same sort of damp, rich soils. It likes full to partial sun, uh, and you can harvest it within 80 to 90 days. Uh, the trick is to deal with the stinging nettle part, uh, in which case you would want to care, you want to want to hold a uh, carry, uh, wear gloves and long sleeves, but you would you, you could cook with it and make pesto out of it and a variety of other things. Um, let's see. Wild garlic. This is another allium. It has a different leaf. You notice this leaf? This is a tubular leaf. So this is the kind of garlic that you might find in your lawn. But you could also grow this in raised beds as well. Uh, it l likes full sun. You might start the seeds indoors, and you're looking for well-drained, rich, organic soils as well. Um, another one, lamb's quarter. This really likes disturbed sites, so you might see it on road cuts and a variety of other things, but it's edible, and it's really difficult to get rid of. Again, uh, let me emphasize that some of the, a lot of the plants that we're talking about here are, in fact, noxious weeds. But they do have markets. They're selling this for $2 a bunch. So, you know, there's potential to, uh, to forest farm these or to actually wild harvest them. Uh, dandelion, another one, uh, just to give, you know, give you an idea. And that pretty much concludes uh, what I have to talk about today. The, uh, pic the plant in that picture is not edible. Those are, that's Galax, and it's used in the floral industry. And I think that's pretty much all I have. Are there any questions? Yeah, I think you've done a wonderful job answering the questions as you go along. Most people aren't able to do that, but uh, yeah, you got them all. Unless Did someone anybody? has some... Anybody, uh, any, other, any other questions out there? Nope, just thank yous, excellent presentation. They love it. <laughs> cool. Um, if you do have any questions, um, I don't know, you could 
you can email I guess me. Actually, yeah, I was going to say, I was like, I can't answer them. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to answer them. I'll give you some answer. It may not be right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody. And just a reminder, you'll be receiving the slides and the recording in an email probably later today. Um, so great. Thank you all for coming. Bye. Bye, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation.